for joining us today. This is the highest attended seminar yet. Um, so we're really happy to have Dr. Gretchen Hansen here today. She's an assistant professor at the Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Biology Department at the University of Minnesota. Her research focuses on large scale drivers of change in freshwater ecosystems, including climate, land use and invasive species. She's especially interested in how local management and lake characteristics influence the resilience of fish populations and communities to regional and global change. Gretchen previously worked as a research scientist for state fisheries management agencies and is committing to conducting actionable science via collaboration with stakeholders and managers. To answer complex questions, she employs multiple approaches, including statistical analyses of historical data, observational field studies, simulation modeling, and large-scale experimentation. So thanks very much for joining us today, Dr. Hansen. Yeah, thanks, David, and thanks to everyone for coming. Um, no pressure when you say it's the highest attended, so hopefully I, I can keep you entertained for 45 minutes or so. So I'm going to talk today about um, this project on cold water fish habitat that has been really a labor of love going on for quite a long time, I mean, even for me and um, other people like Pete Jacobson and Kevin Worley have been working on it for much longer. Um, and it's it's sort of this like burden of mine that I bear that we haven't published this paper yet, but I, I'm gonna come back to some of um, the reasons and reflections on that um, at the end. But it's really one of the projects I'm most excited about that I'm working on. I've, you know, we started working before I even came here to University of Minnesota. As I said, Pete's been working on it for probably decades. So um, yeah, I think it's a really great example of trying to understand resilience of freshwater systems and identify kind of management actions that can counter the effects of climate change or at least slow them down. So um, I'll start just by thanking my, my co-authors. Um, Jake Walsh and Kelsey Vitens were postdocs in my lab who have since gotten jobs, but have helped me with a lot of the quantitative analysis I'm gonna talk about. I'm not gonna go into the details of, but um, just know they did a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Kevin Worley um, at Michigan DNR is the chair of the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership um, Science and Data Team which is a group um, bringing people together from multiple states to work on issues like this and also um, allocate conservation dollars throughout the region. Um, so he um, has led a lot of this work. And then Pete Jacobson, retired now formerly of Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, who was really the pioneer in getting this work going, um, you know, back starting in, in the 2000s and continuing to work on it today, who kind of handed some of the analysis off to me for this. So thanks to all of you. And uh, let's let's get going. So, um, Cisco are also known as tulipy in Minnesotan. Um, they are a cold water fish that is widespread throughout the Upper Midwest, kind of Great Lakes states and the Great Lakes themselves. But I'm just focusing on um, inland lakes today. So they're an important cold water fish here um, in in Minnesota and throughout the Midwest. And their populations have been documented as declining in uh, Minnesota lakes. So this figure comes from an analysis by Pete Jacobson showing declines over time in uh, the Minnesota DNR standard assessments. And then the map on the right shows a, a coordinated effort from um, multiple people from multiple states to go out and sample all the lakes where Cisco had historically been documented and really assess the um, population status in those lakes. And so, um, yeah, so a lot of this, this analysis is built on that data set where these lakes were revisited to document extirpation in a number of lakes, as well as, you know, whether the populations continued to be robust and viable or if they were kind of rare and declining. So we know Cisco are declining um, and being extirpated in some cases. And um, we also know kind of a lot about why. So I recognize that in this audience, there are a lot of non, non limnologists and non aquatic people. So um, we'll get a little limnology lesson here. This is a figure from a Star Tribune article that was published last year, um, highlighting the work that's gone on in Minnesota to conserve um, cold water fish like Cisco. 
And it, it shows in, in deep lakes, um, lakes that stratify. So I might talk about stratification accidentally at some point during the talk, so I'll just uh, explain it now. Um, in, in deep lakes, deep temperate lakes, um, in the summer, we, you can have stratification, which means the lake kind of separates into different thermal zones with warm water on top, um, cold water on the bottom, and this sort of transition zone in the middle. So that means lakes can support uh, diverse thermal guilds of fish. So we can have really warm water species in the surface waters, cold water species in the middle or the bottom, um, but only if that those bottom waters uh, remain oxygenated. And so the um, suitability of that habitat for cold water fish is influenced by how much oxygen it has, which is influenced in part by um, nutrient loading from around the lake. So um, as nutrient, um, nutrients come in from the watershed, they stimulate algal growth, primary productivity, um, that material as it dies um, drops to the bottom of the lake and as it decays can reduce the oxygen content of bottom waters. So for a species like Cisco that needs cold water habitat to persist in the summer, that means they need to be able to access these deep waters and they can only do so if there's enough oxygen in them for them to survive. And, and if there's not, they can get um, what's been called squeezed so that it's too warm above them, not enough oxygen below them, they get restricted to kind of a small layer and, and can ultimately um, experience summer mortality events if they get squeezed out and there's no place for them to go. And so uh, we know that land use influences, land use in the watershed influences the um, nutrient loading into lakes and thus the availability of oxygenated habitat. Um, we also know that climate change causes lakes to get warmer um, in the surface and can also cause them to stratify for longer. So it can mean, you know, the period of time over which uh, these zones of the lake are separated is longer throughout the growing season, allowing more time for that anoxic condition to build up. Um, we also know that high intensity rain events might also be influencing these fish kills. That's an area of ongoing research that I'm not going to get into today. So um, when we talk about the effects of climate change, we're looking just at the effects of, of temperature in this case. So you know, that's kind of the bad news. Cisco have, um, you know, they're stressed by warming, they're stressed by land use, um, it, it, they can die, it looks bad. But the good news is that um, we know that watershed protection can increase um, the suitability of habitat for cold water fish like Cisco. So we know if we protect uh, forested land cover in the watershed that can um, absorb some of the nutrient loading, reduce nutrient loading to lakes and um, create thermal refuge for Cisco and cold water fish, even as lakes warm. So this interaction kind of gives us some hope on a more local level that we can manage uh, the watersheds of these lakes to protect this cold water species, even as you know the global climate warms. And there has been, as I said, a, a lot of work that has gone on over the past decades by Minnesota DNR, both to identify this interaction and to actually implement the results into conservation on the landscape. So Minnesota has uh, spent millions of dollars to uh, protect forested watersheds in a lot of these lakes in order to protect cold water habitat. And I, I personally believe this is you know, the best example I know of in North America and maybe even the world to um, adapt to climate change for freshwater systems to conserve cold water habitat. So that's already going on. Um, so you might say like, well, then why are we having this talk, right? Like we already know about it. Um, but where um, this analysis comes in and kind of what we see as the next steps of this work is the idea that one size doesn't necessarily fit all. So um, although we know that watershed protection can help conserve cold water habitat, um, maybe different lakes don't necessarily need the same level of protection. Some need more, some maybe need less. And if we can identify these uh, lake specific thresholds and really quantify how resilient individual lakes are to changes in climate and watershed development, we might be able to um, further our conservation efforts to be a bit more precise across the landscape. And yeah. And this really fits into this idea uh, of the safe operating space that some of you may have heard of. Um, so the safe operating space is an idea that um, local stressors or local management actions interact with global drivers of change, for example, climate change. And 
as a result, um, even if you can't manage global drivers like climate change on a local level, like say for Minnesota lakes, you might be able to manage this local stressor to uh, move, keep the system in what they call the, the safe operating space. So the place where um, ecosystem services that we desire out of a system, let's say cold water fish habitat are maintained. Um, and this interaction means, you know, conditions that were maybe suitable under uh, uh, one level of climate might become unsuitable as the climate changes, but you might be able to bring the systems back. So let me show you a specific cartoon example for, for Cisco. So if we know that there's an interaction or we think there might be an interaction between um, temperature or climate and watershed development in um, how Cisco habitat or cold water fish habitat is determined. Um, we could call this the safe operating space of suitable Cisco habitat and out here this unsafe ecosystem collapse situation of unsuitable Cisco habitat. So if you have a lake, things are good, cold water habitat's there, um, climate change is going to increase the temperature of that lake and could potentially push the lake out of the safe operating space into the, the bad place of no more suitable Cisco habitat. The idea of this interaction in the safe operating space is that if we know that a local lever such as watershed development interacts with climate change, we might be able to change that, uh, manage that locally to bring the system back. So levels of watershed development that were sustainable and okay under previous climate conditions maybe are not anymore. So we have to adapt, change local management to bring it back into the safe operating space. Um, and in the case of these lakes and cold water habitat, and what we wanted to do with this project is, so we can identify that conceptually as, as a thing that might be happening, um, but we may also be able to actually quantify the distance of each lakes from the edge of that safe operating space. So how, how resilient um, is a lake in terms of how much climate change it could absorb or how much change in watershed development it could absorb before crossing that threshold into unsuitability. And if we can quantify that, um, we, we call that resilience. We're gonna quantify the resilience of these lakes to these different stressors. And um, ultimately, we think that might be useful for management. And another thing I want to note before getting into the kind of the guts of the project is that um, we are not just applying this to lakes that do have Cisco populations present. Um, we are taking the idea uh, borrowed from the Nature Conservancy's uh, geodiversity framework of, you know, regardless of species composition, conserving um, diverse physical habitat as a proxy for, for biodiversity can be valuable. And so we're going to, we're thinking of cold water habitat here as a, a proxy for freshwater ecosystem services associated with well oxygenated waters and diverse thermal habitats being present in a lake. So the results I'm going to show are for um, th tens of thousands of lakes across the landscape, not just lakes where Cisco are present. Um, although we can look at it, uh, we can filter down to look at those lakes too under certain contexts if we want to. Okay, so the goals of, of the research today are to, that I'm going to tell you about, is estimating cold water fish habitat suitability under both current and future climate conditions, quantify that resilience on a lake, individual lake level to changes in climate and changes in land use, and then use that information to help identify priority lakes for either pr protection or restoration um, in the hopes that it can help inform um, adaptation across the landscape. So I have to give you a little bit of a limnology lesson, um, so bear with me um, as I explain this to you. So I already told you that uh, temperature and oxygen together uh, influence the suitability of lakes for cold water fish like Cisco. And um, Pete Jacobson back in 2010 came up with a metric that combines um, these ideas into one metric called TDO3. So this is the temperature in the water column where dissolved oxygen drops below three milligrams per liter, which is a kind of threshold for um, survival. And there's been some debate of, well, should it be three or four or five or six, but we're gonna use TDO3 right now. So the idea here, again, this cartoon on the left kind of shows what I talked about before that in the, if you're not used to looking at these because you're not a limnologist, I'll explain it. So the top panel is temperature, a heat map of temperature um, across the depth gradient of a lake. So the y-axis is depth and the x-axis is across the season and warmer temperatures 
um, are represented by warmer colors. So what this shows is a typical uh, deep stratified lake in our region where um, in the early spring, all the water is mixed and it's cold. Throughout summer, it becomes stratified like I talked about before, warm water on top, cold water on bottom. And then in the fall, it mixes again and everything's cold. Down here on the lower panel, we have oxygen um, where the red means it's below uh, three milligrams per liter, so uh, uh, anoxic or hypoxic conditions that are unsuitable for fish. So throughout the spring, we have lots of oxygen. This anoxic zone um, ramps up throughout the summer and then goes away again. And so if you look at different times of year, you could say, okay, in May, you know, temperature is all good, oxygen's all good, everything's all good, and everybody's happy. Um, in, in July, maybe we're starting to get a little too warm up at the surface, a uh, little bit uh, bad oxygen conditions down at the bottom, but we still have something in the middle that's working out. Um, versus here in this cartoon in September, um, there is no place in the water column that is suitable. We've got too warm on the top, not enough oxygen on the bottom, we got problems. Okay, so that's the cartoon. So we can represent that um, more scientifically by these profiles of temperature and oxygen. So limnologists in the crowd will be familiar with these, where you can measure um, oxygen content from the surface of the water down to the bottom. So this is, you know, up here, this is the surface, this is the bottom of the lake. And, you know, there's a lot of oxygen at the surface, it declines as you go down. Same with temperature, warmer at the surface, declines as you go down. And we can, TDO3 is identifying what is the temperature at the depth where oxygen drops to three milligrams per liter. So here in this uh, panel A, um, oxygen declines after temperature has also declined. TDO3 is something like 11 in this example versus this example, um, panel B, where we see oxygen declining really, really fast in the surface waters. There's a lot of the lake that doesn't have a lot of oxygen. And so the temperature at which oxygen is depleted is a lot higher. Um, it's happening further up in the water column in the warm waters. And so it's something like 24. So Something to remember as we talk about TDO3 is that higher TDO3 means worse habitat. So it means oxygen is um, depleted in the water column sooner. There's nowhere that we have cold water and oxygen if you have high TDO3. So low values of TDO3 are better for cold water fish. Um, and to sort of simplify and make this easier to process, we can actually classify lakes into tiers based on the relationship between TDO3 and Cisco probability of occurrence. So that's what's shown, shown here with some uncertainty that you know, the lower the TDO3, the more likely we are to have Cisco, and then it kind of drops off. Um, and based on some previous work and our new analysis, we classify based, based on um, quantifying the niche boundaries between um, tier one, which we um, call like optimal habitat, really good, good habitat for cold water fish. Tier two, which is this sort of rapid change zone. Um, so still suitable, but becoming a little bit more marginal. And then tier three, where there's really not much chance of cold water fish persisting. So just remember tier one is kind of optimal, tier two is in the middle, tier three, not so good. And we're gonna use those tiers in this analysis. Okay, so now that you know what TDO3 is, um, unfortunately, it's not really, it's not measured in all lakes that we might care about throughout the Midwest. So we've got, you know, 40,000 some lakes across the landscape here in this uh, region that we're looking at. We don't take these temperature and oxygen profile in every lake. So part of the goal of this project is to uh, predict it. And to do that, we used a couple widely available um, variables. We wanted to use variables that were widely available so that uh, we could apply this on the broadest possible scale. Um, and so we've determined in this analysis that cold water fish habitat is determined by lake shape, lake shape watershed development, and um, air temperature. So lake shape is represented here by geometry ratio. So this incorporates the ratio between um, lake area and depth. So things with lakes with low geometry ratios are these kind of small relative to how deep they are. Um, and then as the geometry ratio gets higher, we have these more kind of big puddle, puddly lakes, like shallow big lakes, like Red Lake has a really high geometry ratio. Um, 
And so here is the relationship between geometry ratio and TDO3 in the lakes where we've measured it. Um, there's a strong threshold response of you're likely to have low TDO3, so good habitat for cold water fish um, at lower geometry ratios and then a lot more variability at higher geometry ratios, um, but also higher TDO3. So we know lake shape, lake morphometry, is really important in determining cold water fish habitat. And this is obviously something we can't manage. Um, lakes are what they are, but it's important to account for. So we account for that. And, and then we look at the influence of um, the proportion of watershed that is developed and um, temperature, which the best temperature metric that we found, we evaluated several, was mean July air temperature. And we identify an interaction between those two drivers. So again, um, geometry ratio or the shape of the lake comes into play, but regardless of the shape of the lake, as you increase watershed development and you increase temperature, you also increase TDO3. Um, and there's an interaction between these effects, so you might be able to sustain um, higher levels of, of watershed development if you have um, lower temperatures and vice versa. So we can estimate TDO3 from these three variables, and, and that's um, we think potentially useful. So here's what it looks like if we apply the model that we developed for estimating TDO3 across the landscape of lakes in this eight state region, which I should have said, the eight straight state region that I'm looking at here is the, um, the boundary of the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership that I mentioned. So um, it's a federally funded fish habitat partnership that does um, disperse restoration dollars to glacial lakes throughout the reason, region. So we wanted to estimate this um, cold water fish habitat for as many lakes in the partnership as we could. And you'll see here, um, there's a lot of dots on this map, but there's also some gray ones. So it's not every lake in the region. And the thing that is um, limiting in this case is an estimate of lake depth. So there are a, surpri a surprising number of lakes for which we don't know anything about how deep they are. And we can't use this model in, in those cases. So it's uh, about 12,000 lakes that we have depth information for um, across the landscape that we're able to make these estimates. So this is TDO3 on a map, you know, the, the continuous scale, again, to make this potentially more um, useful and easy to follow, although people could argue about whether it's better to have a continuous variable or categorized habitat. Um, we applied this tier system um, to our estimates to say, okay, here, here's where the different categories of lakes are across the landscape. And this is under, under current conditions. And then we also, as I said, are interested in estimating what's going to happen under climate change. So to do that, we used um, climate projections developed by uh, Michael Nataro and colleagues at University of Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Um, we took those downscaled climate estimates and pulled out, um, we extracted individual values for each lake. Uh, we use the median of six GCMs under the representative concentration pathway 8.5, which is business as usual. usual. Happy to talk more about this to people who care about those kinds of details. Um, but for now, no, we're going to we're using the median um, projected change across um, across these three GCMs. That's the dot shown here, and then we have some variability as well. So we can take that projected temperature change from these downscaled models and plug it into our models of TDO3 um, to estimate. Okay, for a given change in temperature, how much does TDO3 change? And you can see, again, that relationship is, um, is not constant. So some lakes can absorb much more higher temperature change than others um, in terms of how much it influences their TDO3 value. So we can do those predictions and then we can again put them into these classes and say, you know, given our predicted increase in TDO3 under climate change, is a lake likely to switch um, from say tier one to tier two or tier two to tier three? And how uncertain are we about that prediction given the uncertainty in our models? So we can do things like make maps of, okay, here's that contemporary kind of present day situation that I already showed you. And here's what we predict for um, where these lakes in different tiers fall under mid century conditions. You see a lot more red on this map. Um, so maps are pretty, but maybe not as useful. Uh, maybe you wanna know something about um, the number of lakes in each tier region wide and how that is changing. So we can quantify those numbers region wide. We can also quantify those numbers 
on a state specific scale. So we can say, you know, in Minnesota, here's what we think is um, happening with the number of tier one, tier two, and tier three lakes in the region. And again, with, with uncertainty around those estimates. Another sort of um, just side note um, that we have started playing around with is looking at the spatial shift of the kind of optimal habitat um, boundaries and where you're likely to have lakes falling in these different tiers and how that's shifting um, or projected to shift under climate change. So um, the blue lakes are those tier one lakes where, you know, under current conditions, they fall, you get high probability of having tier one lakes kind of along this eco region boundary um, that runs diagonally across the region. And we see that shift um, significantly northeast um, under future climate conditions with um, high probability of tier one lakes becoming restricted to like the Arrowhead, the UP, Northern Michigan, and really being pushed substantially out of Wisconsin, for example. So that's just an interesting aside of kind of that spatial shift. So to bring it back to um, the safe operating space and resilience, um, as I said, we can we can make these predictions region wide or statewide, and that may or may not be useful for different um, policy frameworks. But we can also look at individual lakes and say, um, how resilient are they to climate change or to watershed development? And let's really quantify that the distance of that arrow. How much do each of these factors influence individual lakes? So um, we, we get a couple of situations in terms of resilience when we do this on an individual lake level. So some lakes, um, in terms of their uh, predicted, if they're gonna, gonna cross the boundary between suitable and unsuitable habitat, some lakes are, are not as affected by watershed development as others. So there are some lakes um, that we project, you know, climate change is going to move them like this. And even under high levels of watershed development, we predict that they're still going to maintain Cisco habitat. Um, so we, we would call these refuge lakes that um, based on our relatively simple model, um, we, we don't predict that these lakes are influenced by watershed development strongly in terms of their um, TDO3. Of course, there's lots of other good reasons for protecting the watershed in these lakes, and this is a pretty simple model, but given if the objective is to um, conserve TDO3 to keep it within the boundaries of a certain tier, we don't predict that um, these lakes are likely to cross a boundary, so we call them refuge lakes. On the flip side, some lakes have limited potential for cold water habitat no matter what we do. So um, climate change might be predicted to push them outside the boundary of suitable Cisco habitat. And even if uh, we fully, you know, reforested the entire watershed, we predict these lakes still have limited potential for supporting cold water habitat. So we call those limited potential. So probably more interesting comes into play in the middle ground where watershed development really does play an important role. So we have some lakes where we predict they're still gonna be suitable for Cisco or for good cold water habitat conditions as climate changes. So even under warming conditions, we say there's still gonna be good cold water habitat here, but only if we can um, keep watershed development under a certain threshold level. Um, and the magnitude of that um, pr protection level that's needed and thus the resilience of these lakes varies among lakes, um, but at some level of development, they're predicted to cross that threshold. So we call these lakes that are candidates for watershed protection. Uh, we wanna keep them in the watershed development zone where we still expect to have cold water habitat. We have other lakes that um, we predict climate change is gonna push them outside the boundary of suitable habitat. But if we were able to restore the watershed, we might be able to bring them back in. And so um, we call these candidates for restoration. And again, the amount of restoration that they might need to cross that boundary varies among lakes. So we can see the difference in the distance to that threshold and what we call resilience here in um, this histogram for both tier one and tier two lakes. So for individual lakes or groups of lakes, we can ask questions like, how much development um, in the watershed can increase for a lake and remain in tier one. And you know, for some lakes, it's not very much. They're really close to the boundary. For some lakes, it's a lot. This is proportion of the watershed um, disturbed. That's why it goes from zero to one. 
we can ask things like how much restoration is needed to return a lake that might have flipped to become tier two into tier one. And that's what's shown with these negative values. And again, some of them are really close. We don't need very much. Um, and some of them need a lot of restoration. And then we can ask similar questions for tier two lakes. How much can development increase and have a lake remain in that tier two sort of marginal habitat status? Um, and if a lake has flipped into unsuitable or limited potential, how much restoration needed would be needed to bring it back into at least the marginal level. And again, how this information is, is used and how you prioritize among lakes that fall in these different um, different classes or have different levels of protection or restoration need uh, really depends on who you are and what your objectives are. So uh, for example, if you are the MGLP and you are making conservation dollar allocation decisions across this whole region, you might want to know the number of locate the number and the location of lakes in these different classes across the whole region to say, all right, you know, which ones do we, how, where can we focus our conservation dollars to get the most bang for our buck across the region? On a state level, you might have different priorities and different information needs. So for example, um, Indiana has a small number of lakes that are predicted to maintain Cisco habitat, although tier two, um, but that are considered to be tier two secondary refuge lakes in Indiana. So if you are in northern Minnesota, you might consider those lakes less important. But if you're in Indiana, those two tier two lakes are highly important for conserving cold water habitat. Um, and, and you're really probably interested in the identity and location of those lakes. And so that's part, this geographic variability is part of the reason why we use this tier one, tier two, tier three approach, because from a region-wide perspective, you don't wanna say, you know, we're only gonna conserve like the best of the best. And as a result, you know, focus only on Northern Minnesota, Northern Michigan. Um, we we wanna say, if you're in um, Indiana and you care about cold water habitat, you still have some links you can focus on and here they are, even though they may not be as, you know, utmost pristine high quality as lakes in the far North. So those are some, examples of what you know the region-wide framework or a state framework might want to know. We also know that lots and lots of people are interested on the individual lake scale. And so we can use this framework in an individual lake scale as well. Um, and we can do things like what's shown here. So predicting um, TDO3, so that at this point on that continuous scale, for an individual lake um, as a function of watershed disturbance. And so what we show here is the, um, the dot is the current level of water shed, shed disturbance um, and the predicted TDO3 under future climate conditions. We have uncertainty. And then the line shows um, how we expect TDO3 to change in that individual lake um, if watershed disturbance were increased or decreased. So you can imagine kind of moving these dots along this line. And then the, um, the orange and the blue lines show the thresholds between tier one and tier two and tier three. So you can imagine at an individual lake level, you might wanna know where are we now? Are we you know, close to a boundary and what would happen if we increase or decrease and how uncertain are we about those predictions? Um, we can estimate all those things for individual lakes. If you didn't wanna look at TDO3 on a quantitative scale like this, some people do, some people don't, maybe you're more interested in the probability of falling in a certain tier, we can do that too. So as you change watershed development in a lake, um, what's the probability of being tier one and how does that kind of fall off as you um, increase watershed development or you know, conversely, how, how close could you get to, how likely would it be to be tier one if you potentially restore the watershed? So we can do this for individual lakes, as I said, um, you know, 12,000 some across the landscape. And we can provide information that hopefully is useful for conservation decisions on multiple scales from the individual lake to the whole region. And I'll just make a little plug for the Midwest Glacier Lakes Partnership um, Conservation Planner. So they have a website right now that uses um, some models that we've developed of uh, fish community composition and how it's affected by uh, various factors in lakes. So you can look at kind of the whole region wide view and you can zoom in on individual lakes and um, get some information on the vulnerability of different species and how watershed disturbance and shoreland disturbance comes into play. So this doesn't currently include the um, 
the outputs of this newer model, but we plan on incorporating that going forward. So um, that was the sort of rapid fire uh, science talk. Uh, just to sum up what I talked about, uh, what I see as the take home points here. So cold water fish habitat in glacial lakes is widespread throughout the region, but um, vulnerable to climate and land use change. Individual lakes vary in their resilience to both warming and land use change, and we've quantified that resilience. And in doing so, we can identify lake specific restoration and protection targets for the watershed that hopefully can be used to inform climate adaptation decisions. So we still have some time. And because I have the soapbox, I'm not done yet. So I wanted to share a few life lessons from this project. Um, and you, some might see this as my excuses of why this paper still hasn't been submitted for publication. So we can also consider this an extended apology to my co-authors. Um, but also I think, I know there's a lot of grad students in the audience and um, I think there's some lessons here that might be worth hearing or if not, just bear with me for a couple more minutes. So one le life lesson relates to actionable science and doing science that, um, that you hope is um, useful for conservation or for decision making. Um, and I think sort of a naive view of science um, that probably nobody here actually has, but one might have before they've actually, you know, started doing science work that is policy relevant. You might have a view of, okay, I, a scientist, I'm going to do this analysis. I'm going to like transmit this information to decision makers and, you know, things, things will be good. They'll know what to do and everything will be great. So in this case, you know, I could say here, this is it. Here's how to protect Cisco. Like, all right, done. But of course it doesn't really work like that. And, um, Almost all of the time, uh, decision makers who are actually, you know, making policy on the ground have lots of competing objectives that they're thinking about, both in terms of um, things that science can inform. So we don't just care about Cisco, we care about lots of fish species, and we don't just care about conserving species, we care about, you know, angler satisfaction and harvest opportunities. And we don't just care about protecting lakes, we care about other aspects of land use and economic value and all these things. So. It's always complicated um, and decision makers have a lot of different facets of this system to weigh. Um, and, uh, and so there's really no easy answer. And in my experience um, with this project and with other projects when I worked for DNR was um, what it really takes is a lot of iteration um, and two-way communication of science, science can say, you know, here's what we've found and people who might be interested in using the results of that science can say, okay, but here are all the things you're not thinking about. And um, by taking that information and trying to incorporate it the best we can and continuing to iterate, um, hopefully we end up with a more valuable product, product, but it is definitely slower and more painful. So there has been some iteration on this project. Um, most recently, the um, I presented some of these results last year and had some questions, really good questions from um, policymakers and people who use the data who I think are in the audience today about, well, how certain are you of these thresholds? And, and what are we going to do when we have these thresholds that kind of differ from what we've been working towards? And that really led to incorporating the uncertainty into the analysis, um, which took a pretty heavy quantitative lift, but we, we have it now. And we haven't fully accounted for uncertainty, but at least we have um, some uncertainty incorporated into the analysis. So I'll be really interested to, to talk more about how how that might be helpful or not, or what else we might need to, to make this useful going forward. So that's life lesson number one, is that um, working on you know, actionable science and things that have policy implications, it takes iteration and it takes time, um, but hopefully the, the time is worth it and you end up with a better product in the end. The other life lesson I wanna just touch on it to kind of normalize where we are, it, like it feels weird to me to be giving a scientific talk today because like we are working during a pandemic, right? We're all stressed out. I haven't given a science talk for, I don't know how long and it, it feels, feels weird to be doing it right now. And so this project has certainly been slowed down um, by, by the pandemic as I think many of us are experiencing. It's just the weight of dealing with our lives and everything that's going on and still trying to you know, move our science forward. 
And the fact is that the impacts of this are disproportionately felt by women and people of color. Um, this is a preprint that um, shows manuscripts being submitted as planned um, by race and by gender. And, you know, like most impacts of COVID, um, women and Black women in particular are, are more strongly impacted um, by, by COVID and the pandemic on academic productivity. Um, and I just also want to uh, point out this paper that has come out recently, um, led by a group of women, one of whom is at University of Wisconsin, and it's really great. So they, they published these 10 simple rules for, um, they're focusing on women PIs during a pandemic, but I think the rules apply to anybody who's feeling um, additional stress of trying to work during during COVID. Um, one of their suggestions, I won't go through all of them, but one of them is say no to requests to do anything outside of your main responsibilities. I thought this was funny because me giving this talk is maybe, you know, violating this rule, maybe not. Um, and they actually point out in the paper that they're all violating this rule by writing the paper. Um, but that's one to keep in mind. I think the biggest one is their suggestion number three of you have to drop something. So uh, as we take on extra work during this pandemic, you know, increased mentoring of um, students who are struggling, increased teaching and caregiving obligations that many of us have, um, something has to give. We can't keep doing everything that we did before. And unfortunately for me, this has meant dropping a lot of my research tasks that I actually truly get a lot of joy and satisfaction from in my job, but I, I just can't do it. And so the, the, the research and the writing has really fallen off for me and I'm sure it has for a lot of you. And I just wanna say you're not alone and it's, it's okay, we'll get through it. Um, so they have a bunch of other rules or suggestions um, and I really encourage that you look at them and read the paper and um, think about it for yourself and for people you supervise and, and everything else. Um, and, I, and I just want to end with uh, an explanation of the photo that I put for this, um, for this talk, which is me um, in my hockey gear uh, in, the, in the 80s. And this, one of their suggestions, their last one is don't lose your sense of humor. Um, obviously, there's nothing funny about what's going on, but if we can find ways to laugh and like bring a little bit of humor and joy to our lives, um, we should just take advantage of that. And they actually have a supplement with a bunch of really funny things that they got from their conversations, including COVID bingo. Um, so again, I encourage you to check it out. And then my, my last life lesson um, is, you know, even as if you feel like you're failing at work and all this stuff is falling behind, as I think many of us do, I do think we need to take time to just live our lives. We can't always work all the time, right? And so, um, Let's just take time to enjoy the little things we have, whether that means celebrating the great British baking show, like my children, or getting a pandemic puppy like we have. Um, so yeah, we'll get through it. Work will be there. Enjoy your life. So that's my soapbox. Um, I will stop now and just say thank you to everybody who's contributed to this project. I also want to thank my um, lab members for um, continuing to cr try to create a sense of community and keep working throughout this difficult time and I'll take any questions. Looks like we have plenty of time. And let's see if I can get the chat where I can see it. Unless David's gonna read me the questions. Oh yeah, well, whatever is easier. Um, All right, I got it, I can see okay. it. Just, okay, first one is not a question, it's about learning about lake stratification, great. Do you have a link to that publication from Caroline? I don't know which publication, but I, if you send me an email, I'd be happy to share it. Okay. Um, oh gosh, now it's moving a lot. What variables were the best predictors for refuge lakes versus other lakes? So, lake size, depth, or watershed disturbance? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, so for, we didn't make, um, individual predictions for refuge versus not. Are you saying what's most influential, the morphometry or watershed disturbance? Um, I'm sure that it would be morphometry um, that had the biggest effect, but then within, you know, this sort of restriction imposed by lake shape, um, watershed disturbance also played a role. I don't know if that answered the question. Z Locklear, you can chime in if there's more questions.
Okay, Kristen Plan says, thank you. Okay, oh, I'm wondering if you or your co-authors have presented this to any of Minnesota's Lake Association organizations recently. I have not. I don't know if anybody else has, but would be happy to talk about it. Jake Shaughnessy says, where would you find some of the data that you talked about? Jake, are you still there? And can you chime in and tell me which data you're talking about? Well, if you're still there, Jake, let me know. Okay, another question. Um, I can't. Is there any relationship with this work to other factors of lake health, nutrients or sediment impacts? Um, there's certainly a relationship. We, like I said, have focused on a pretty simple model of just cold water fish habitat. Um, there are lots of other impacts of nutrient and sediment loading on lakes that are not incorporated into this framework. So um, yeah, we, I wanna be careful to be clear about that, that there's lots of other things to conserve about lakes besides cold water habitat that are influenced by these things that this model can't say anything about. Oh, okay. Jake says, looking at the Cisco extirpation, um, that is held by the um, MGLP. If you're interested, I'm sure we could um, share some of that data where there's people working on various publications with it, but um, why don't you send me an email or get in touch and we can talk about it. Okay, another question. I am not familiar with Cisco. Has Cisco been extirpated due to development? Why did you choose to study it? Um, well, I would say Cisco have been extirpated due to the combination of development and climate change. Um, why did you choose to study it? I mean, I really, like I said, picked up a lot of the work that um, had been started prior to my time working on this. I find it really interesting to study because of this safe operating space idea and the idea that we can manage local factors and have an impact on um, climate change that might sort of feel out of our control, especially on a sort of state or local level, that there are things we can do to um, conserve cold water habitat even as the climate changes. Um, yeah. Paul Freider says, how does the safe operating space of Cisco overlap with the thermal optical habitat of walleye? And does increasing water quality for Cisco cause declines in walleye because of this? How is Minnesota DNR dealing with this? Paul, that is an excellent question that brings together two research avenues from my lab. Um, I do not know the answer of how the two things overlap. Um, yeah, I could guess, but I, I might get it wrong. It would be interesting to look at the partitioning of both of those kind of zones of, of habitat suitability and how increasing one might influence another. Um, but we haven't looked at that yet. It's a good idea. I don't know how Minnesota DNR is dealing with it. I think that's all the questions so far people putting in links to things. Thank you. Any other questions? If people want to unmute, just talk. Hey, this is Tom Jones. Hi, uh, Tom. You, uh, your temperature projections um, extended to, to mid-century um, and so, so your, your, your forecast is like maybe for the next 30 years or so, but uh, certainly climate change will persist beyond that. Um, I mean, is, is there really much optimism for cold water habitat if we're looking at 80 or 100 years down the road? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so it's, when I say mid-century, it's like a 30 year period that straddles mid-century. So it's it's a little bit longer than than that. But um, your point is, is still well taken. Um, we haven't done the projections in this particular model to the end of the century. Um, I, I think there will still be some given the level of 
we did play around with um, that climate resilience estimate, like how much temperature increase could the lake take before it crosses a boundary and found that, you know, when I was playing around with it and pushing the temperature increase up to 15 degrees or something, we still had some lakes that were suitable. So it's the deep ones in particular. So I think there is still hope even as the climate gets quite a bit warmer, um, but it will require you know, change, doing something about conserving the watershed. And yeah, um, so there is still some hope. I think some of those marginal lakes would fall off. And we do have those data actually that we could look at. Um, in my experience working with fisheries, climate change stuff, um, the 100 year, 80, 100 year time frame is um, hard to wrap our brains around, I think. And e even the 20 to 50 year time frame can be challenging. And so the feedback that I have gotten over the past, you know, five or eight years that when I'm working on this stuff is focusing on the most immediate future, e even the climate projections in themselves can be sometimes not as useful as like hindcasts. But if you are going to do climate projections, the closer, closer we can get to now seems um, a lot of people give me the feedback that's more useful. Um, did that answer your question, Tom? Maybe, sort of? Yeah, more or less. Okay. All right, Nathan says, what are some examples of other cold water fish species that we affected by TDO3? Would you consider this model generalizable for fish other than Cisco? Yes. So um, in Pete's original TDO3 paper, or one of his papers, I can't remember, there's too many. Um, he has a paper where he looked at the thresholds, the TDO3 thresholds for all cold water lake fish in the state. So lake trout, lake whitefish, burbot, am I forgetting any? Um, and establish those thresholds for all of those species. Um, Cisco is actually the most, or the least sensitive, can, um, has like the least restrictive requirements. And so other cold water fish like lake trout or lake whitefish or burbot are more sensitive. Um, and we could generalize the model um, we would probably classify the tiers a little bit differently um, because we're not just applying this to cold water fish lakes. We wanted to use the Cisco threshold um, as sort of a proxy for just generally somewhat suitable cold water oxygenated habitat that's going to be valuable for a number of different ecosystem processes. But if you really, if you wanted to do it for say lake trout, you could definitely do that with this model. You would just need to re-parameterize those tiers. Okay, Benton says, does this model incorporate watershed size and percent development? Um, it does not incorporate watershed size directly. Um, it just incorporates proportion developed of the watershed. And Don says, there is a symposium on Corrigonids at the 2021 Virtual Midwest Fish and Wildlife Conference and lots of papers on Cisco. Thank you, John. There's a link in the chat for those who want to learn more. Can I ask a quick follow-up to my question then? Sure. Do you think that there would be a big difference in like predicting like a refugee lake or needs management based on watershed size? Or do you think that it's more on percent or proportions? Um, well, watershed size is going to also be correlated with lake size. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. Pete could probably answer this question if he was here, but um, I'm not sure. So far, proportion seems to work well for our purposes, so we're going with that. Sounds good. Gretchen, it's Joseph here. Uh, you mentioned how, and thanked your lab group for maintaining a sense of community. Uh, what are you guys doing? What, what, what might you share that could be helpful to others? Um, well, we're, I, I don't know if they feel like we still have a sense of community, but hopefully they do. Um, we're continuing to have lab meetings um, where we do various things, you know, from, like next week we're hosting a guest, not next week, two weeks we're hosting a guest speaker. We've worked on our lab web, website together. We've done practice talks. We've done just updates. Um, we played trivia. 
Um, and then I've also been really impressed at everybody's willingness to help. I've, I'm recruiting a number of positions and people have, you know, met with and given feedback on candidates and just been really engaged in that way. That I think helps keep the community going too as we recruit new people in this virtual space. Um, I have two new postdocs that are starting that have been joining our lab meetings even before they've started, which has been really cool to, you know, kind of create a new community. So I don't know. I, I think the biggest thing that I try to do is just be um, open and empathetic about all the struggles that we're facing and go from there. Good stuff, thanks. Okay, well, <clears throat> thanks very much. That was an awesome talk and I appreciate the part at the end as well. So um, thanks very much, Dr. Hansen. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming and feel free to be in touch with any, any questions or comments or anything else. Thanks, Gretchen, it was very good. Yeah, thanks.